this, dear Hector, is the Gotter Canal, where I'm waiting for the 1110 to Stockholm. I had a terrific night out in Gothenburg City last night, a cultural haven of trendy nightclubs. But not wishing my staff to see me under the weather while I was relaxing, I sent Scott, my assistant, on ahead to do the shopping and look for cultural inspiration in Sweden's capital. In the meantime, I intend to spend a few hours relaxing on board this splendid canal ship, the MS Juno. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Splendid. Hmm. To the good ship Juno. It is a journey where one can drink and contemplate the state of the universe, or not, as the case may be. Stockholm, with its waterways and islands, is known as the Venice of the North. It's a city of splendid contrast. Tucked away in the middle of the city is the 13th century Gamla Stan, which means the old town. And walking through its cobbled streets, you can feel yourself being drawn back through time. Its medieval market square, fine old churches and crumbling fortifications give me the feeling of having passed this way before. Excellent and invigorating heart-starting glass of sherry, absolutely perfect for a fine Swedish Sunday morning. I'm going to cook a paella, a dish much abused, much misunderstood, but in fact it's one of the finest rice dishes in the world. It's, after all, only the Spanish version of a biryani or a pilau. First thing, into some hot olive oil, we'll throw some pieces of rabbit. And these must all be nicely brown. Now, it's always boring watching things go brown, so I'm doing a second dish today, which is a North African dish of chicken cooked with honey, almonds and onions. Now, I've already been frying the whole chicken jointed, the back bits, the legs, the wings and everything in olive oil. So they're nice and crispy and brown. Into that, we add some chicken stock. We'll let that simmer for 20 minutes. In the meantime, back to the paella, where I've added some onions and red and green peppers. And then some garlic. And season with a bit of salt and pepper. And now, short-grained rice is absolutely essential for paella. Make sure it's well coated with the oil that you've been frying your chicken, or rather your rabbit, peppers, onions and garlic in. Then the extravagance that I get so much pleasure from is putting in about a million pounds worth of saffron. Some water, there's no need to use stock because the rabbit and the other fishes will create their own stock. Now, we pop the lid on that and ignore it for as long as you've got the nerve before we put the fish into it. Now, my chicken is bubbling away nicely over here, so I'm going to add some cinnamon into that. Now, if I can find my pot. Ground cinnamon. Chopped ginger. Or rather, that's garlic. I'm very, very sorry. And chopped ginger. And we let that cook away again till things are ready. Now, this is the most interesting square, this cobbled square. In medieval times, the women of the place used to heave their rubbish out of the windows and consequently there was a pile of what you could politely call, you know, crap all over the tiles, all over the, the things. And it was here, so they say, that the lady's high heel shoe was first invented because it enabled them to walk across without treading in all the poo that they threw out of the windows. Next we pop in some saffron, powdered and fronded. Some mussels, some clams, some prawns, and some chopped up raw lobster. We'll season that lightly with some more salt. Now a little tiny drop of olive oil. And we'll put the lid back on so that the rice will steam the fish cooked, the juices from the fish will run into the rice and flavour it even more. 
For my chicken, I'm making a sauce of fried onions and almonds mixed with honey. Now back to the paella. And it's very important to get a few crunchy bits on the bottom of a paella, a bit like the crunchy bits on the bottom of a Yorkshire pudding. Or a waffle, or anything. You get a nice little flavour out of that. Now it's courgettes cut up, cooked very lightly in a small amount of chicken stock with the flesh of three or four lemons, spoonful of sugar and a big handful of chopped ginger. Just simmered very, very gently and then chilled. And it's an absolutely delicious dish that goes with, for example, my chicken, which I'm going to serve onto this plate down here now. That's the basic chicken bit, and a little bit of this sauce. And then, I'll have to lift this over. The almonds and the onions go over that. Wipe that off, and you season it nicely with fresh coriander and dill. Richard Pate is sloping, so it's spoiling the way the sauce is going. So that's that one. That's the chilled courgettes that go with it. Just a few frozen peas into the rice here. You can use fresh, but why bother? Because they don't exist. Chuck over some parsley. Stick around some wedges of lemon. I think you have quite an acceptable Sunday lunch. Southern Sweden, like Denmark, is flat as a pancake, except for the odd mound in the road. And I'm heading for the Kronovald Chateau, home of the Orkson family. Anders, for it is he, produces a third of all the sparkling wines in Sweden. The grapes are grown in Italy, and the second fermentation takes place here at the Chateau. So it's a sort of a European-Swedish co-production. As ever with wine, there's much talk of the flavour from the hedgerows, the aroma of falling autumn leaves, the fresh fruity tang from the crabapple tree, and the rich, full-blooded smell of a departing skunk. For me, wine is all about enjoying the atmosphere of bars and restaurants and mulling over life's rich patterns with a glass or three. Very good. Are, there, are there Swedes uh, big wine drinkers, or have you had to educate them into...? Well, I would say uh, we are working very much to make wine as it should be, a simple... Uh, drink that you use for everyday food, right. you know, that is very important, yes. I think. Yes. Wine could be a little bit snobber in Sweden. <laughs> Here, on this wonderful estate, they make this splendid sparkling wine. Now, I didn't know they could do that in Sweden. Anyway, this is where we are. And on big, grand estates like this in former times, at the time of the harvest, be it corn, cherries or wine, the owners would cook a splendid stew for the estate workers. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. If you'd like to come in, Vlad, we'll have a look at this. This is the kind of dish you would find in Spain on a finca, in Italy on a vineyard. It's a dish that you make from anything you have. And I've got, let's have a little look here, I've got some chickens, I've got a bit of lamb, I've got our roasted goose, which I've already roasted because I want it to be as if it was preserved goose. I've got the chef's sausages from the restaurant in the estate behind me. I've got some unsmoked bacon and some smoked bacon, some spicy blood sausages and some spicy ordinary sausages. I've got wonderful soaked beans which provide the bulk of the meal. I've got little bundles of leeks and celery and carrots and splendid artichokes, garlic and little onions. It's a long, simmering dish, the sort of thing you have in the autumn as the, as the evenings get cooler and all the harvest has been brought in. First thing we will do is pop into this slow simmering pot some vegetables, some leeks, some celery, some carrots, and a little bundle of parsley stalks and bay leaves, a handful of sea salt, or maybe two handfuls of sea salt. The next thing, we'll put a piece of smoked bacon into the pot and some unsmoked bacon into the pot. Now, for those of you who are proper cooks, you will know that 
Because those are the slowest cooking things, they go in first, and things like the chickens, which will take a lot shorter time, will go in about 20 minutes. But this is a television programme, and we can't be bothered to wait for 20 minutes. So we'll put the chickens in straight away. A couple of peppercorns and a little bit of dried thyme. I couldn't get any fresh thyme. One of the problems we do suffer from is it's sometimes difficult to get ingredients, but we've done jolly well here with all of these bits and pieces. Then we'll put in some lamb. Like that. Then we will put the lid on and let those cook for a little while, for about 20 minutes, before we add the next lot of ingredients. And after the 20 minutes, I popped in some onions, garlic and the soaked beans. Later, I will add the rest of the ingredients of sausages and roast duck and let the whole feast simmer on a gentle heat for a couple of hours. Splendid. I've got a little bit of goose liver. Just that little bit. Now, goose liver, as you know, is one of the most expensive and most deliciously gastronomic experiences you can possibly have in your life. Foie gras droit. But I've been thinking, I ought to do something with it. So on here I cooked a little bit of polenta, which I flavoured with cinnamon and sugar and fried on my plancha. I'm now going to, using this splendid Amadeus um, sweet sparkling white wine and some lovely grapes, try and make a nice little snackette with goose liver. So we're going to sear that. Just very lightly. Might just add a teeny weeny weeny knob of butter. Needs to be cooked very light, dear little things. <laughs> See you at Christmas. Sorry, didn't really mean that. Actually, I did. We just sear that lightly on both sides. Then we're going to zap in a little bit of sweet wine. This will sear up and go mad. We will add a little bit of goose stock. We will immediately remove the little slivers of goose liver. We'll pop those on there like that. We'll tip in some excellent grapes. We'll whisk in a little knob of butter. A fraction more of the stock. To reduce that a little bit. And then just put a few grapes over that and a drop of the sauce. Clean the plate a little. Table's all wibbly wobbly. Polenta cakes, a little bit of foie gras. Lovely grapes and a perfect little starter. Brilliant. This dish is cooked. So if you'd like to come in and have a big loving little look at it, we will serve it. Bubbling away, Chef Michael's sausages, the goose, the hams, the lamb, the vegetables. Exactly, back up to me please Vlad, exactly the kind of feast to give to hard-working people like me and the director and all these other people who are just sitting around having harvested the grapes and culled the corn and shot the geese and done all things that country people do. So we'll arrange all of this on the plate for our feast. We'll start with the gooses because they are nearest. Some lovely boiled lamb, a chicken, boiled chicken, Splendid sausages. We've got smoked and unsmoked bacon. The leeks, carrots and artichokes and beans are served separately in some juices from the stew. And what we do is take a bit of goose, a bit of ham, a bit of chicken, a bit of vegetables, some sea salt, some horseradish, some fruit jellies, some mustard, some vegetables 
and really, really enjoy ourselves. There are some 90,000 lakes in Sweden, many of them full of freshwater fish. And Johan and his family have worked this lake for three generations. His nets are full of perch, bream, zander, and very large pike. This is a wonderful catch, and the fish will make a variety of delicious dishes. I must say, though, throughout my travels across Scandinavia, I've been very impressed with the skills of the fishermen. We've seen more fish caught on this trip than in all my previous fishing expeditions put together. It's not just the fishermen, though. The waterways are so well stocked because the Scandinavians are so environmentally aware. I'm going to cook about three or four different dishes today, if I can. The first thing I'm going to do, if my fire is on, oh, it's not, I first must light the fire, is I'm going to make a little relish for one of my dishes. This whole thing is a story today. It'll all build up by the time the dishes are in front of you. So it's a bit complicated, but it's fun. You don't need to look into this if you don't want to, Vlad, because I can show you as I pour in what I'm going to pour in. First of all, into a pot on a fairly fierce gas, some oil. And then I'm going to add some chopped onions. If you can see that all right, I'll do it with all of them, OK? Chopped onions go into there. Then we put in some chopped red peppers, like that. Then we find a bit of a spoon and stir those around till they sweat down a little bit and soften. We'll tip in some chopped tomato. I've actually used tin tomato, but you can use fresh if you want to. Tin tomato into that. Then some finely chopped ginger, garlic, and some jolly hot chilli, fresh chilies. Ginger, garlic, and chilli. They all go in there now. A little bit of sugar, a tablespoonful of sugar, and finally a bit of vinegar. This is, happens to be apple vinegar. You could use wine vinegar, sherry vinegar, any kind of vinegar that you like. Okay? Then, this very unique machine is a steaming device. Now, into this steaming device, we're going to place some white of leek, some green of leek, and some carrots. That's the first thing that's going in to my steaming device, which is set on a piece of tin foil inside the steamer. Because equally, you could use a saucepan and a colander with a bit of tin foil in it, but I like this fascinating new machine, so I thought I'd, I'd buy it. Right, the next thing we do, freshly caught a fresh river bream, scaled, Definned and gutted, but left whole. And that goes on top of our little bed of vegetables. Again, you can't see into that, I know, but take my word for it, they're all in there. Then, little Chinese black beans, hot chilli, garlic and ginger. They all go over the top of the fish into there. Like that. Then we put a little bit of sesame oil. Oh, that might be a lot of sesame oil. You don't need too much sesame oil. It's very, very powerful stuff. Just a little bit of that in there. Oh, that is steaming. Right. So that's that phase for that one. Lid goes on. The fillet of Xander is covered in oil and coated in crushed chilies with salt and pepper. Next fish is going to be the fillet of perch. And this morning, when I was shopping, I found a very interesting sort of combination of spices I'd not seen before, but I expect you all have. It's probably an American thing. It's lemon pepper. It's little peppers and mustard seeds, all spicy things, which have all been aromatized with lemon. Perfect for fish. So we'll put that onto there. And again, we'll give it the same little bit of treatment with a bit of pepper as well, and a little bit of, a tiny bit of salt. The relish is cooked, so I'll tip it into this bowl here, ready for 
a bit. Um, sorry, I have to do this away from you because I'm. That's our tomato, onion, chili, pepper, ginger relish for a little bit later. We can turn over the chili fish now, start to cook that on the other side. See how white and lovely the fish is beginning to get. Then the other thing I did, I got some basic tandoori powder, mixed it with yogurt, a little bit of oil, a little bit of water and marinated these fillets of perch. So we just take off the most of that and we'll pop those on there. One, two. And finally onto the plancher we'll put our lemon fillet of perch. Right, then I must start preparing some relishes, one of which is going to be yoghurt and into that we're going to put some of this lemon balm and we'll put some cucumber into that as well. Our second relish is going to be mayonnaise with segments of lemon, lime and orange in it. Is the tandoori fillets of bass, I uh, beg your pardon, not of bass, of perch. As I said, perch is the freshwater equivalent of bass. Our next fish is our Cajun grilled zander with chilies and all on it. Our third one is our lemon peppered perch with grilled fruit, lemons, limes, oranges and so forth. Pop that on there. beautifully steamed fish with ginger and vegetables and for its final and black beans of course and finally just a little bit of oyster sauce on that <laughs> and then with our lemon pepper fillets of perch we have our fruit mayonnaise with the tandoori perch we have our lemon balm and cucumber yogurt. We have our spicy piquant tomato chili and pepper relish. There we have it. One, two, three, four. Totally original Swedish and Scandinavian international dishes. It is midnight on the first Thursday of August a night of great importance to the Swedish fishermen and the lovers of crayfish. It's the only time of the year they're allowed to catch these delicious crustacea, and this lake, called Skåns Vasche, in southern Sweden, is one of only three lakes where the crayfish still breed. Sweden, like every other European country, has had great problems with the crayfish pest, so many of the crayfish we now eat are imported from Louisiana and Turkey. This lake is jealously guarded by the community and there can be serious violence if poachers invade it. Of course, the crayfish catch is a good excuse for families to get together for a serious booze up. It is very important you have a big pot of boiling water and into that you put some good Swedish beer. Lots of Swedish beer. While they're singing merrily away in the background, we'll pick those up later. Then, because this is a Scandinavian program, we'll add some Norwegian aqua wheat into that. We will do that, because that's quite good in the olden days. Then, because this is a Scandinavian, sing, 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 please. Thank you. It's singing is a celebration. These Swedes, I don't know. Sing, sing, more singing. They're not singing very well. Anyway, in, because this is a, a strange program involving Louisiana and Turkey and Sweden, we then put in some oranges spiked with cloves into the water. Then we put some lemons spiked with cloves into the water. 
Then we put some potatoes, lovely potatoes, in the water. Then we put some red skin onions in the water. Then we put some sweet corn in the water. Sing, sing. Let's see some jollity, some Swedish happiness. Then we put in a great big bucket full of Cajun spices and stir those spices in. Right, that will make our stock. All through the night, the catch will continue, as will the celebrations. But in 12 hours' time, that's it. Until next year. In they go. And in the way of things, the lid goes on, and the beat goes on, and they sing again. They do. So, my dish is cooked, but I have to say, for those of you who find it difficult to understand, the only way to enjoy crayfish is to cook them live. If that's offensive, I'm sorry, but that's how it happens. Anyway, a big fat close up there, because that's me throwing the lid away. This is my version of crayfish. We're gonna put them onto the plate here. This will take some minutes to remind you they're cooked in beer, Cajun spices, Swedish snaps. And in my view, what you do, you put in lots of butter over all of that. Lots of butter. Lots of black pepper. Chuck on some dill. Come and eat some of your crayfish. Have a go. This is a fabulous dish for a party, a big party that is, and I think it's time for me to enjoy a slurp or two. Very good, very good. Very, very good.